Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And it's so wonderful to be here. And to our listeners online, welcome to the Musar podcast. My name is Rabbi Ari Wolby, and it's an honor to be with you this morning. I want to give you some history before we begin learning Musar and understanding what it is, just why I'm here and why I am teaching this class. First, you need to know, I don't teach the Musar teachings because I'm perfect. It's because I'm not perfect and I, want, and I pursue perfection. I want to reach perfection. And if, if you're facing a challenge in any of the traits we'll talk about, I promise you I'm facing similar challenges. So by no, by no, uh, no imagination should you think that, oh, he's just preaching to us because he's perfect and we need... No, no, I'm, I, I have a lot of... The only reason I teach this... Uh, is because I want to work on myself, and this is a great way for me to remind myself of the different traits that need perfection. And we'll talk about that in, in a few. Um, this is a study we're going to be to, doing together, and I have some handouts I'll be giving out throughout the class. And for the listeners online, you can email me, and I'll send you happily send you these on email. Now, I want you to understand just my perspective on this world, on the Jewish world. As you may see, and as the rabbi mentioned, he mentioned Orthodox. I'm an Orthodox rabbi. I'm not an Orthodox rabbi. I'm a Torah observant rabbi. And I'll tell you the difference because I don't believe in Orthodoxy. I don't believe in conservative. I don't believe in reform. I don't believe in reconstructionist. I don't believe in any of them. I think they're labels and they're nonsense. There are two types of Jews in my perspective. There is a growing Jew and a stagnant Jew. And my goal and my objective is that through my learning I become a growing Jew, and through my teaching, everyone becomes a growing Jew, and that we don't stay stagnant people, right? Naturally, we like to stagnate. We don't want to rock the boat, but we, I, I want to encourage all of the people I learn with on a regular basis, I repeat this almost ad nauseum in other classes, that we are here to grow. That's the purpose, not to become one blend or another blend or this type or that type. We're not here to be robots. We're here to grow. I know many people who may have grown up in a religious home, put on tefillin every day, keep Shabbos every week, but haven't grown an inch, not, not a centimeter in their spirituality. And I know other people who grew up without any Judaism at all, but because they're learning, decided, you know what, I'm no longer going to put cheese on my burger. I'm no longer going to eat shellfish. I'm not, that's a huge step. That's a growing Jew. And that's what we appreciate. That's what I believe God, the Almighty, wants us to do. And I have many proofs. We'll talk about this in the, in the future. So that's my general philosophy. I don't see shades. I really don't. I really, I consider people by their desire to grow. Um, and that's really the way, as an organization, we're an organization that's trying to um, encourage and urge people to take a step in their Judaism. Whichever congregation they're, they're part of, whichever um, affiliation they have is really irrelevant. Take a step, make a commitment, become stronger in your, uh, in your growth. I want to also give a thank you to Congregation Beth Yashurn, our host, uh, for inviting me here and for allowing me to teach these classes. So let me give you some history. My grandfather, Rabbi Shlomo Wolby of blessed memory, was born in 1914 in Berlin, Germany, and passed away in 2005. Uh, he was uh, born to a very non-observant home. Rabbi Shlomo Wolby, uh, his parents were not religious at all, didn't keep any form of observance at all, but he grew up with a, an intrigue and an interest in observant lifestyle. How? I don't know how, but he always had this, you know, my grandfather said that when he uh, was, when he was a young boy, about six years old, he was walking with his father. His father was a professor. His father was very anti-religious, um, had very little sympathy for religious people. And they were walking together and they bumped into a rabbi who happened to be a rabbi of an Orthodox synagogue. And the rabbi shared many of the, um, professorship degrees that his father, my great-grandfather, had. And th it, they hit it off, and that rabbi eventually encouraged my grandfather's father to send him to a religious day school to go to some type of you know Hebrew day school. And from there, he, he kept on growing. My grandfather begged to go to yeshiva, and when he was 13 years old, his parents allowed him to go to a gymnasium in Frankfurt, which was a Jewish day school, in Frankfurt, 
And uh, after that, he went to a yeshiva in Switzerland. He was there for a couple of years. And the agreement was, a fascinating story, the agreement was that after those two years in the yeshiva in Switzerland, he was going to go to university. He was going to come back home to Berlin and go to university. Now, the last, the last Shabbos that my grandfather was to be at that yeshiva, there was a, a uh, scholar in residence that came. And that scholar in residence gave the first Musser lecture my grandfather ever heard. And my grandfather's lights turned on. And he was like, he, he, couldn't, he, he couldn't get enough of it. And he went over to that rabbi and he started asking him questions. He's like, so the rabbi says, you know, I think you should go learn in the Mir Yeshiva in Poland. And my grandfather really didn't know what to do, so he wrote a letter to his parents. Now, let's cross cross to where, my, where his parents were. His parents were at that time on a cruise heading to Italy. And on that cruise, there was a fortune teller. And they're sitting in front of the fortune teller, and the fortune teller tells them, your, I guess this was an entertainment thing that they had on the cruises. I don't know if they still have that today on cruises. They do, fortune tellers and car yeah. mind readers and card readers and all that. Yeah. All right. So, um, so they go to this fortune teller. Fortune teller says, you have a child a son who's going to be writing you a letter. And whenever you arrive at your destination, you'll receive this letter. Whatever he wants on that letter is going to be some odd request over there. Whatever he wants, allow him to do it. And in that letter, he asked to go learn the Mir Yeshiva. And they let him. They're very superstitious. They let him go to the Mir Yeshiva. My grandfather learned the Mir Yeshiva. My grandfather told me this. He said he felt like he was born when he entered into the doors of the Yeshiva. He got to know, uh, he got to know, he was overtaken by his rabbi. His rabbi was Rabbi Yerucham Levavitz. And Rabbi Levavitz was an incredible man, what they called in Adam Shalem, a perfect man. Someone who had all of his, uh, his traits in check. Someone who knew when he got angry, that he got angry, paid attention to it, noticed it. And we'll see in a second what, what, what that means. I, I'll give you just a quick example. I, taught, I told this in one of the other classes. My uncle, may he live and be well, lives in Brooklyn, New York. His wife was very, very ill. My aunt was very, very ill. It was before she passed away. And my family was in New York for a, uh, for a wedding. And right before Shabbos, we had a, few, we had a, uh, we had a little bit of time. And uh, we decided we were going to go in and say hello to my aunt and my uncle. And we go in. And it was very hectic. It was, she really wasn't doing well. They had like the changing of the guards of the nurses that were on call. And they were on the phone with the pharmacy and with the doctor and, and trying to get the right medications. And it was all chaos. I realized it probably wasn't a good time. I said, good Shabbos, you know. And, uh, and, and I, I left with, with my wife and my children. A few weeks later, we were back in New York again. And we said, we want to go visit again. I went back to visit. And this time, my uncle was so kind and so gracious he had the table was set for us he had candies for the children he had cakes and cookies and drinks and i'm like well, what's what's all this for he says the last time i felt so terrible that i didn't properly greet you i didn't properly give you the time you came from texas you came to visit you came to to see how we're to inquire how we were doing and we were just so overtaken by all of the medical staff and all everything that was going on i didn't give you i want you to please sit down and we can talk and we can have the proper uh, you know it's like i was wondering it's like how in the world did someone have the the frame of mind to think that someone walked in Someone wasn't given the right proper attention and now to want to make it up in, in such a way. I was like, I was blown away. And there's only one answer that I can come up with. And that's because he was a Muslim man who evaluates his day every day and thinks, what did I do right? What did I do wrong? What did I, in, when, in all of my interactions, could I have been kinder? Could I have been nicer? Could I have been friendlier? Could I have greeted someone with a smile today? Could I have done something to help another person? And perhaps didn't. And he evaluated his day at the end of that day and said, you know something? My nephew came in from Texas, came to visit, and he would give him, you know, I said, hi, how are you? And I was busy with, the, with things which are understandable. But he wanted to make sure he greeted every person properly. He wanted to make that up. So when we came the second time, right? But that is a classic example of a Musser person. 
someone who wants to work on himself. We all make mistakes. We're human beings. But to notice, to pay attention when sometimes we do something wrong and correct it. And hopefully the next time we're even stronger and, and, on, and on cue to, to perfect it. One of the, the participants of the Musser Mondays class told me, he says, you know, this changed my life. This whole Musser study changed my life. He says, just, he's, when he told me this was a couple weeks ago, he said, just last week I was traveling and it was a pretty empty flight. And I'm sitting, hopefully nobody notices that he has the empty seats next to him. And he wants to spread out a little. And there are plenty of empty seats, plenty of empty rows. And this woman comes and asks, do you mind I sit right over here next to you? And he says, you know what, there are plenty of other seats. You can go sit over there. And then he thought to himself, he says, oh, my goodness, Rabbi Wolby would be so upset at me, right? What type of muster is that, that I'm, I'm, I'm just not welcoming this person in? Like, so he, he felt terrible about it. And he said on the f- two flights back, the exact same thing happened. And he said, sure, come sit right next to me, please. You know, no problem. And the idea is that we're going to talk about this more soon. We're going to be tested. I've had dozens of people tell me, you know, Rabbi, I never had an issue with arrogance till you spoke about it. You spoke about the topic of arrogance in the class and suddenly I realize I'm so arrogant. That's the idea when we're going to discuss, because many times we associate arrogance to what someone may have called someone else arrogant because they talked about money. So we think, oh, they talk about their money, that's arrogant. But we don't realize that being boastful about our record uh, running the marathon might be arrogance or uh, being boastful about how great we are in, with, in, in art or writing or speaking or all of these great talents, that might be arrogant. So when we discuss each of these traits, we're going to learn from the sources of our sages what these traits really are. And it can really transform um, our perspective on these traits and hopefully transform who we are by being able to pay attention and being sensitive to these different traits. My grandfather, one of the things that he told us about his rabbi, Rabbi Lovavitz, was that he, he arrived, I think, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and he met the rabbi. And, you know, there's a study hall where every, the Beit Midrash where everyone would, would sit and study. And a student comes out and he says, oh, it's so great to see you. And he's like, my grandfather's thinking to himself, maybe this is someone I knew from, from the past. And I, I didn't, I, I, I don't remember who this was. You know, it's like, and then the next student comes out. He's like, oh, shalom aleichem. It's so, it's so nice to have you here. And my grandfather's like, every guy who's coming out is so friendly. What's going on? He realized this is what they were, they were taught, how to greet someone in a way that they'll feel loved, how to greet someone in a way, not, not superficially, but in a genuine way to really be excited to see another person, to really be d- delighted to meet another student. Imagine if we had this in our high schools. We wouldn't have bullying. We wouldn't have, well, it, people would just be gracious and kind. So it was a Tuesday or Wednesday that he arrived there and he saw the rabbi, Rabbi Lovavitz, you know, who had become his, you know, his be-all and, and everything really till the end of his, my grandfather's life, uh, his, his whole uh, mission was to follow the teachings of his rabbi. And he came and he saw where he stood for prayer, you know, where the rabbi sits, the rabbi has the rabbi's seat. Comes Friday night, my grandfather comes into the study hall where they prayed as well, and he sees somebody sitting in the rabbi's seat. My grandfather, the young student, was about to approach the person and say, you know, you're sitting in Rabbi Lovavitz's seat. You shouldn't be sitting there. And he went over to one of the other students who was there for a while already. And he says to him, who, who's sitting in the rabbi's seat? They said, no, that's the rabbi. He says, but it doesn't look like the same person. He had a glow about him on Shabbos. Like during the week, his face w- didn't have color. But on Shabbos, his face was beaming. His face had a glow. They could, my grandfather couldn't. My grandfather wasn't senile, okay? He couldn't recognize his rabbi. He had such a different aura, a different, a different presentation about himself on Shabbos that was just unrecognizable almost. And they got used to it every Shabbos. And one Shabbos, they see that he has a, a, a face of the weekday. He didn't look like Shabbos. So they approached the, the rabbi and they said, Rebbe, what, what's going on? Why do you look like this? 
You always have this glow on Shabbos, and now you look terrible. See, he said, I just got news that there was a a terrible person who lived in in Germany, uh, who was this is talking about in the, in the in the pre pre Holocaust, but there was someone who lived in Germany who was a Jewish guy uh, who did terrible things against Jewish people. A self hating Jew. I'm not gonna. I don't. I don't remember the exact name, so I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna repeat it. But um, either way, he passed away just this week. So they said, so what? So he was a wicked person. So what do you? What are you so afraid? What? What's the problem? He says, yeah, but you don't understand. He says he's standing in front of the heavenly courts now, and what's he gonna say for himself? He says he's a Jewish person. He's my brother. He's your brother. I'm worried for what his answer is going to be in front of the heavenly tribunal. He's not going to have what to say for himself. And that's caring for every Jew. That's feeling what someone else is experiencing. My great-grandfather, from my grandmother's side, my grandfather's father-in-law, his name was Rabbi Avraham Grudzinski. He was the spiritual leader in the city of Slobodka in Kovna, where there was a great yeshiva in Slobodka. And one day... He looks at his watch and he jumps out of his seat and he starts dancing and he's dancing and everyone's like, what's going on? He's just dancing. He s- so the, after he sat down, they asked him, they said, Rebbe, what's going on? What are you dancing? He says, right now my student is getting married in another city. I couldn't be there, but I told him I'll be happy with him, with his simcha, with his joy. That's, that's feeling a connection to another person. Now, and we'll get into these traits and understanding how this really brings a person because when someone else feels pain, do we feel their pain or we just say, oh, that's terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. Or do we really feel their pain? Do we really feel their pain? Or are we just saying things? Or we really have no idea what they're experiencing. And, and we're just saying it so that they feel like they have someone. But we really don't really feel it. When someone is angry, do we really feel what they're angry about? Or we just want to calm them down? Say, you know, you're really right, but you know, some, sometimes people do stupid things and, and, and we just try to encourage them. Or do we really feel what they're upset about? And that really needs to be our goal as becoming Muslim people is opening up our sensors to feeling what's going on around us within ourselves and outside with other people. We're going to get this. We're going to have plenty of time to go through each and every trait to discuss them in great detail to understand what the Torah and everything is sourced. I want you to know something. One of the foundations of everything I teach is based on the, on the fundamental principle that rabbis don't have the authority to make up any rules. Rabbis don't have the authority to make up anything. Everything must be sourced. It needs to be sourced in the halacha, which is backed up by the oral Torah known as the Talmud and the Mishnah, and backed up in the written Torah known as Tanakh, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. So at any point, I'm not going to give sources because it could be a point of confusion, but if you have any question after class, I'll give you the exact source for every single thing that I share with you, whether it's in Talmud, in Mishnah, or in, in, in some other source in, 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 the, uh, in the Torah. My grandfather, after being in Poland for several years, got a letter from the Polish government that because he was a German citizen would have to leave because the war had broken out. My grandfather decided to go to Sweden, which was a neutral country, and he went to Sweden and had two main successes there. Number one, and he was a young man, he was uh, 24 years old, 23 years old, he had two main successes there. One was, is that he opened up what was known as a Beit HaMusar. Beit HaMusar is a house of study of Musar. It was the first thing he did. And every single day he studied Musar. There are many books of Musar study, and we'll get down to the background of it in a, in a few minutes. But he, he spent time every single day reaffirming his connection, his understanding of himself, of the world, of his responsibility in this world. And he said that that's what preserved him through the nine years he lived in Sweden, alone, without a community, without a rabbi, without a synagogue, without really anything. One day he opened up the newspaper and he heard that there was a kinder transport coming from the camps and they were bringing Jewish girls from the camps 
to Sweden because there was a shortage of girls in Sweden. They said, we'll bring these girls. They'll marry these Swedish men. It turns out they were all Jewish girls. My grandfather's like, we can't let these girls intermarry. We've we got to do something about this. See, these girls are probably orphans. They're pro- we have to go help them. So my grandfather immediately got on a train, traveled eight hours to meet these girls where they were arriving. And along the way, he put together a plan of how he was going to open up a girls' school. And he meets these girls, and he says, listen, you can't go anywhere. We have to, you have to come with me. We have to create a school for you. Now, one of the things that they, that my grandfather said is that when he met those girls, he brought, he packed with himself a little lunch. He, the girls had food. They were fed by, the, I guess, the Swedish government. And my grandfather washed his hands before he ate his bread. And then he held his bread and made the hamotzi lechem in aretz. And he looks up after he bites into his bread and he sees all of the girls are crying. All of the girls are standing around him and they're crying. They hadn't seen this blessing being made in five years. They grew up in homes where their fathers were rabbis. Their, ra- their fathers were, were involved in the Jewish community. Here they were in camps. They were, they've seen their families murdered. They've seen such tragedy. They've never seen, in five years, they've never seen someone wash their hands and make hamotzi. And they were all crying. My grandfather, at that point, realized he must do something very serious about this. Immediately, he contacted other rabbis who were around in, in Sweden, and they wrote, they got they got together, they wrote a letter to the Swedish government saying these, I think it was 400 girls that arrived, we need to do something for them. We need a, we need a building. Okay, anyone here familiar with bureaucracy? How long would it typically take for government to respond that you need a building for these 400 girls? It would take a very long time. The next day, they had a building. An unbelievable miracle. All of those girls came on a train. They arrived at that place. It was called Leadingo. That's the, the village that they had that building. And they had a school there, a seminary. There were older girls, 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds. And all of those girls, um, there's actually a book that was written about Leadingo. I've seen over uh, through the years, I've had literally hundreds of people come over to me and say, you know, my grandmother was one of those students. And I had people all the time, my grandfather would come visit us in New York, these elderly women would come and they'd say, you know, they'd say to us, we're students of your grandfather, we're alive because of him, we're Jewish today because of him. And uh, interestingly, my grandmother was one of those teachers. And they met there, and they eventually got married in Israel. When they arrived in Israel, they got married, and my grandfather started a yeshiva, called Be'er Yaakov. It was in a little village called Be'er Yaakov and uh, had thousands of students. Over 40 years he ran that yeshiva, had thousands of students come through the doors who are today all well-known and accomplished. Not all, but most are well-known educators. If you read books on Jewish education, uh, my grandfather's quoted there extensively. A tremendous amount is written about his, uh, his methodology in education, his understanding and character, etc., etc. He himself published many, many writings. Uh, his most uh, prominent writing was the book called Ale Shur. And Ale Shur is uh, one of the verses that in the blessings of Jacob to his children. It says about Joseph that he'll be Ale Shur, he'll be walking on the wall. And the idea is walking on the wall, you can see the difference between the two worlds. And it's like, you know, in, in the Matrix, you have the red pill and you have the blue pill. One, you can live in oblivion and you'll never have a problem. You'll never worry about anger and no one will no one will bother you. And the other one, you're going to face challenges and you're going to work on perfecting yourself and hopefully attain perfection. And that's the world of Musser. The world of Musser is that we recognize that we have deficiencies. Each one of us have deficiencies. We have things in which uh, we need to work on. We need to perfect ourselves. I have over here, I brought copies for everyone, but... I actually have my own chart of my own traits. Okay, now I'm not going to show it to you because it's private, right? And you don't need to show me yours. But the idea is for every person 
to have a chart like this to know yourself the top that the top part are your strengths the bottom part are your weaknesses and for every person to really get to know themselves is a very big gift and it's not easy i'll tell you that i've had over the years probably several hundred people have gone through the muster classes here in houston and have said you know rabbi i'm i'm, I'm having a challenge um sometimes the challenge is i don't want to see the good because that might say i'm arrogant i don't want to see the bad because that hurts so you have this this uh this challenge on both sides this my grandfather always said knowing your n- not knowing your flaws is a problem but not knowing your qualities is a tragedy you must know your qualities you have to know what your strengths are what your weaknesses it's like it's like a sales team not knowing what their best product is not knowing how they can sell a product you have to know yourself and not because you're trying to sell yourself, but you have to know what you're built of. We're all built of traits. I have over here a sheet which is um, titled Understanding Myself. Okay, I'll give them out here. And you can take it home, fill it out whenever you want, and you can look at it again at any time. I took an, a random list of 14 positive traits. Is it 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12? 14 positive traits and 14 negative traits. Now, these are not, you, you, it could be that you have other traits that are more meaningful to you. That's fine. I just arbitrarily picked 14 traits and put them on a list, and you can mark yourself from weak to strong. But you need to think about it so, you know, for a second. Where are, am I really in this trait? I'll give you an example alacrity, zrizut. Right? When something comes up, do I take care of it right away? Or I say, you know what? One day I'll get to it. You know? And this is a, is a positive trait to get things done quickly, to get things done without delay, to not push things off. It's a very great quality. It's a positive quality to have zrizut, is to do things without delay, right? So am I weak at that or am I strong at that? Ten being strong, one being weak. So mark yourself, eh, maybe I'm a five, maybe I'm a four, but it's fine. This is for yourself. It's private. You don't have to share this with anyone. In six months, we'll do this again. And hopefully you'll see that through the discussion of these traits, We've improved and we've excelled in certain areas that we've taken perhaps the trait of appreciation. Where am I in appreciation? Do I always appreciate someone else, my spouse, my children, my parents, my neighbors, my friends, right, my congregation? Do I always show proper appreciation? Do I feel that appreciation? Even if I don't show it, do I feel it at least? Do I have that feeling in my heart? And We'll talk a lot about each of these traits, probably two to three, maybe four weeks about each trait to really get a grasp and an understanding of what the trait really is and having, having, and, and having of course, t- giving tools to accomplishing that change in our lives. So I'll have these here on the, on the table for anybody who would like. I'll have them available so you can take them. You can do them at home. Um, had a question? When you listed some of, of those traits, they immediately seem recognizable to me. But I would have trouble coming up with, with 14, you know, of either side. How would you suggest we stimulate our brains to come up with something? Okay, so, so I would like to introduce you to several books that talk about Musser traits. And each one of those... Um, I, I have a list actually. I'll share the list. I'll bring them next week. Uh, a list of all of the different books that I recommend as as great reading to learn and understand. Uh, several books from Alan Marinus uh, from the Musser Institute, um, where he deals with specific traits. But I have also a list. This is from the book Begin Again Now by Rabbi Zelig Pliskin, where he has a list of two hundred and twenty one. Two hundred and twenty-one positive traits and three hundred and thirty negative traits. Yes. You know, again, it's it's not that you have to focus on fourteen. If you focus on two or three, because you're going to have the whole year. But if you're not clear, one of Rabbi Wolby's assignment was ask someone near you to just tell you three positive and negative traits for yourself, and you know, in a neutral environment. And it's really incredible because you can't work on them all at once, but yet they'll intertwine. But hearing the ones that your family and friends say, they'll be a trend, and it's really incredible. Every year I ask that same question at this time of the year.
That's right. I, I do that. I do it as well. And I, I call my rabbi. I have a weekly phone call with my rabbi in Jerusalem. Uh, it's a very cherished time that I speak to him every Wednesday night. And every year at about this time, I say, Rebbe, you know, we speak every week. You know my ins and outs. You know what's going on. I ask him questions, personal growth. I ask him about uh, questions of uh, marriage, questions of child, uh, of, of education, child rearing. Um, I ask questions about the organization. I ask questions about friends, circumstances that come up. I talk constantly with my rabbi, ask him questions and, and seek his counsel. So he sees a picture that I sometimes don't see of myself because I'm busy with my whole life. He gets that glimpse and he can see certain patterns. I say, I want you to give me straight. Tell it to me straight. It's before Rosh Hashanah. What do I need to improve in? It's before Yom Kippur. What do I need to repent in? And uh, sometimes he says, no, you're doing great things. And sometimes he'll, he'll tell me something which will shock me uh, to my core. And uh, it's worth it. It's the best advice you'll ever get is someone who will tell you, uh, who will give you the, the, the uncensored truth about yourself. Because I'll tell you something very interesting. Do you drive a car? You drive a car. Everybody knows that when you drive a car, there's an area called the blind spot. Right now, I'm looking at all of you, and I see peripheral vision. I see over here. I see Bobby over here, and I see this young lady here, right? So I see I have, I have about, and, about 170 degrees or 160 degrees with peripheral uh, vision, okay? But there's a whole section of about 190 degrees that I don't see. Now, you see it, and you see it. Everyone here sees it. It's what's going on behind me. So imagine there's a board hanging right on top of me, and it's about to fall on me. What would you tell me? Look out. Yeah, look out. Careful. Rabbi, right? So imagine that was a negative trait. I don't see it because all I see is what's in front of me. I don't see those negative traits. I don't see jealousy. I don't see anger. I don't see all of the negative traits that we have listed here. So I'll, list the, I'll tell you the 14 that I chose arbitrarily and uh, tell me, uh, you, 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 might, you might suddenly say like, wow, I didn't even know that was a trait, right? Uh, so we have alacrity, appreciation, caring, cleanliness, Faith, generosity, happiness, humility, kindness, loving, order, patience, truth, will. Right? These are all great, great positive traits. If we had all of these positive in like perfect, we'd be like pretty awesome, right? Uh, and I'm sure we all are. Everyone here is 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 awesome in in your own right, respectively. Um, but I I certainly aspire to hopefully achieve. Greatness in all of these positive traits. Negative traits, aggression, anger, arrogance, dishonesty, envy, flattery, hatred, laziness, lust, sadness, selfish, stinginess, stubbornness, worry. Right? These are all traits. And we're going to go through over the coming year, we're going to go through, I might, I might base it on this list of 28 traits, the 14 positive, 14 negative. We might pick other traits. If anyone here has an idea of a trait, you feel like, it, uh, Rabbi, this is something I really want to talk about, I want you to talk about, I'll happily talk about that, that topic and do whatever research is necessary. As you can tell, I have over here uh, 31 different sections over here on material. This is, some of it is old material that I prepared over the years, and some of it is brand spanking new. So I'm looking forward to sharing it with you. Okay, so my grandfather published this book, Al Eshur, and this is his most famous work. It took him 28 years combined to put together both volumes of that book. The first one took 15 years, and it, which is not a very thick book, but it's a very deep book. And then the second book took 13 years, and a combined 28 years, it's not ideas and concepts that he researched. It really is an autobiography. He really is writing about his own struggle. He's writing about his own growth. In every trait that he writes about, he's actually talking about how he worked on it. So it's not like it's proven, tried, and, and real tools to perfect traits. When he talks about any trait that he, dis he discusses, he's giving you what he has tried. Now, if someone tells you you're going to a new location, you're going to a new, a new city, who would you trust how to get around the city? Someone who actually lived in the city for 10 years or someone who just looked at Google Maps? Right? You trust someone who actually lived there who can tell you, oh, make a right turn there, make a left turn there. When you see that sign, that's right. 
you'd trust that someone who's worked through Musser study, who's worked on the, these traits, um, it's a much better guide than just you know someone who does some research. Today, when people write books, they take some time off of their career on television, do some research on a topic, use Wikipedia as much as they can, and put together a book and give you information that you typically wouldn't have had. Right? Here, this is not a book of research. It's not a concept. This is, he worked through this himself. He went through those struggles himself. And he's writing his findings in, not again, most people don't look at that book that way. They look at his wow, he just writes this nice idea. I'm t he worked on this. I know he worked on it because I lived with him. I had the privilege of living in my grandfather's house for several several years and being there, having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with him uh, for, for a while. Now, I'll tell you something interesting. When I was 15 years old, I grew up in New York. Um, and when I was 15, I decided I was going to Israel. I wanted to learn in a real yeshiva that was serious about Torah study. And I went there myself. I told my parents, hasta la vista, I'm out. And I went to Israel. And I, my, I spoke to my grandfather in advance. And he said that he would set me up with a yeshiva not far from where he lived. One of his students had a yeshiva. And I went there. Now, it was, I didn't even realize how big of a struggle it would be. He was an American boy coming into the Harvard of Israeli yeshivas. Um, and these guys were advanced. These guys knew what they were learning. I, I couldn't hardly read the stuff. And one morning, a guy comes rushing to my room when we're getting ready for, for prayer services, like 7.15 in the morning. He comes rushing to my room. He says, your grandfather's here. I'm like, what? It's like the big rabbi. What is he doing here? My grandfather came for many months. He came to be there for morning services at Shacharis to be there with me. To get, he knew the weight he carried. He knew how respected he was in the community. And he knew that this would be a tremendous vote of encouragement, of, co of confidence that he would give me by being there. And he had a very busy schedule, but he took time to be there with me for service. And he would stand right next to me and put on his tefillin next to me and dava next to me so that I had this like extra backing. And it, it, it's such a special thing. When we'd leave, like everyone would be like, morning rabbi it's like you know they'd be you know it's like with such awe that people would have in reverence they'd have such a great rabbi and there i'd be holding his in his arm you know holding his hand and walking home with him was like the greatest pride but i didn't notice what a challenge i was facing at the time but he noticed the challenge and he said you know i need to give him that boost i need to give him that assistance i need to help him out but that's someone who's thinking about someone else's situation. We're so busy with our own lives, so who has time to think of someone else's problems, right? That was that's that's a Musser giant, a Musser great, someone who really thinks not only for himself to make sure that his character is, is proper and and hopefully reaching attaining perfection, but thinking about other people and really putting themselves into someone else's situation. Rabbi, I have a question. Sure. What about um, navigating boundaries? so you're not overstepping. I think it's wonderful that your grandfather came and it's fabulous that he would do that for you. Uh, but I'm just concerned about that. So uh, the key to all of Judaism is balance. Everything. I actually just spoke to someone yesterday who was at my house and his father is a convert. I said, what inspired your father to convert to Judaism? He said... He was born Catholic, and he tried to ask questions, couldn't ask questions, and he tried exploring other religions. And every religion he lived in, he lived in Indonesia for five years with the Muslims there, and he saw that there was there was no there was no balance there as well. It was it was extremist to one way or the other. And then he was in Turkey, and he was sitting in some Bedouin village. And he said, I have enough money to either go to Germany or to go to Tel Aviv. Where should I go? So this random stranger in this Bedouin village that he was in says to him, go to Tel Aviv. The Jews will make sure you're always fed. <laughs> so he went there. And he lived in a kibbutz for a few years until he met this young woman who says to him, you should come with me to Jerusalem. And she introduced him to a rabbi there. The rabbi started learning with him some Torah. And he's like, this, this is what I've been looking for. This is what I've been searching. 
you know, here it's open, it's balanced. That's what the word he used to me. He said it was balanced. It makes sense. Judaism is about having a good time but being serious enough to not be, you know, crazy, right? There has to be a balance, and Judaism is all about balance. You know, we have a holiday that is dedicated half to you, half to God. Half to you, half to God. Chetzi lachem, chetzi lachem. Why? What's the idea of a holiday? What's the idea of, of, of Shabbos, of Sabbath? The idea is to connect to the Almighty. But God doesn't say, connect to me and disconnect from yourself. No. Wine and dine. Have a good meal. Cook that brisket. Enjoy. Come to synagogue and pray so we can talk, we can have a conversation. We'll talk about prayer. You'll see that prayer, you don't need to be in a synagogue and you don't have to have a minion. You don't have to, you can pray in your car and you can pray in, your, in the library and you can pray while you're doing groceries. You can pray anywhere. Prayer means a conversation with God. And that's something we should utilize. But we'll talk about that. We'll get through that. But it's a great question. There always needs to be balance. We have to know that balance. We have to know where are we uh, going into the area of unwanted territory. But again, when someone is connected in a real way, um, you, 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 get, you get a feel. You know, okay, I'm overstepping my boundaries. I'm not wanted here. Or it's best for me to step back. And that's part of it is to, is to, is to know where is our place and where is not our place. I'll just tell you one quick thing about my grandfather. He was a very methodical, very methodical. He had more of a German type of uh, order to the way he thought and the way he organized his his uh, his ways. Um, my father, in the early 80s, when my grandfather started publishing these books, um, he said, you know, there is something called a word processor. Maybe Maybe instead of using a typewriter, I can get you a computer. You can type it into a computer. So my grandfather says, for what? He says, like this, you can edit and you can move paragraphs back and forth and you can... I was like, I never needed to change a single thing I wrote. Never changed. He wrote it. It was all pre-organized, pre... My grandfather used to type this out. My father was a little child. He would start typing out the first, the, the first book. My father would, would, in the morning, early morning, four or five in the morning, it was, they had a two two-bedroom apartment, a very small apartment. And my father slept in the living room, which was also the kitchen, which was also the dining room, which was also the, you know. So it was also my grandfather's study. And my grandf- my father would wake up hearing the typewriter. Tick, 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 tick. And then there would be a few minutes of silence and then a barrage of typing again. Tick, 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 tick. Like, you know, and it was all organizing it in his mind and executing, organizing it and executing it typing it out. So um, I also had the great privilege, my grandfather would speak in many different, after he left his yeshiva in 1982, uh, he started lecturing all around Jerusalem, all around the country, all around the world really, um, and giving his Musser discourses. One of the most prominent places where he was speaking in was the Mir Yeshiva. The Mir Yeshiva is the largest yeshiva in the world. Uh, there are over 9,000 students sitting and learning Torah every single day. And he would come there every other Tuesday and give a lecture to you know hundreds and hundreds of people who would pack into one study, one of the study halls. And uh, that was on a Tuesday. But Saturday night, he taught in one of the great yeshivas in Bayit Vegan in Jerusalem. And he would start immediately after Shabbat because he needed a microphone. And his voice couldn't project that loud. And due to the regulations of Shabbat, he was not able to use a microphone till after Shabbat. So we would walk on Shabbat. I would walk with him many times. I would walk with him from Givat Shaul all the way to Bait Vagan, which is about a 45-minute walk for a young man. And my grandfather was in his uh, mid-70s at the time. And um, we would walk all the way to... Uh, to Bait Vagan, and there he would, you know, just get himself ready. And as soon as Shabbos was out, he would uh, he would uh, begin his lecture. Uh, but that was a great opportunity. I would, you know, have this chance to walk with him, uninterrupted, for forty five minutes to an hour every week, and to ask him questions and just, you know, talk about. It. Now you have to understand to have a grandfather like this. The many people say like, "Wow, that must be really awesome." I'm like, "Yes." But everything has its counterbalance. You know, I never spoke to my grandfather about sports cars or about sports 
or about, you know, a nice vacation. And I, it's like those things were not relevant to him in any way, right? So not that he wasn't connected with this world. He was very connected, but not in that kind of way. It's like sports was, was too to uh, juvenile in a way for him, for you know, a man of that status, he wouldn't talk about that. Now, I love sports. My kids love sports. We watch games and we go to games and it's great. But again, there has to be a balance. So, you know, my grandfather was a great man, a very, very holy man. But that wasn't one of the, uh, one of the uh, side benefits of being able to talk to him as an American boy, talk to him about, you know, some of the fads that we have in him. It was not, it was not something that we... So I never went with my grandfather to a baseball game, okay? If you were <laughs> asking yourselves, no, I never did any of that. Uh, it was much more of a serious, um, more focused uh, conversation whenever it was. Okay, so let's get, to the, to get down to it. What is Musser? And we hear this word, Musser, if you go on, on uh, Google or you ask Wikipedia what Musser is, they'll give you pages and pages and pages to read. Uh, but I'll tell it to you in, in briefly. Musser means, there are a couple of translations to it. It can mean correction, instruction, or even modernly, in the modern uh, he Hebrew, it actually means ethics. When someone says, Zilomu Sari, they say it's not ethical. Right? You have that in the Knesset, uh, the most ethical house in Israel. Right? But um, when they say so, well, they'll accuse each other of, of, of some wrongdoing. They'll say, Zilomu Sari, it's not ethical. Right? It's not proper. Now, we can translate Musr to ethics. That's fine. But I believe like this. A personal and individualized message is what Musar is. Musar comes from the word Meser. Meser. Meser means a message. There's a message. Every one of us have a personal, individualized message. And that's what Musar is. Musar is unwrapping that message. Now, if we're starting off at the beginning of a Musar study, hopefully for a year-long study, it's important for us to know that every one of us are given our own circumstances, our own challenges, our own successes, our own challenges that are unique to us. So we're all born in different homes. Any siblings here? No siblings here? Um, uh, and even if you have a twin sibling, I guarantee you, you're not the same. Right? Any t set of twins that we know they don't like the same color. They're not, not attracted to the same types of people. They don't like sport, the same type of sports. One is more active than the other. One, is, one likes art and one likes uh, music and one likes this. They're never the same. They grow in the same home. They grew up in the same. They were actually, they were in the same uh, womb together, right? And yet they, they don't like the same things. Each person is an individual and they're unique and they're special. And with that uniqueness comes our own baggage of positive and negative traits. We all have our own set of positive and negative traits. And un unpacking that is really what we're going to try to do through a Musar study. We're going to try to unpack what are my traits, what are my characteristics that make me who I am, who make me unique. We all have a different set of parents. We also, even if we grew up in the same neighborhood, as many of us may have, in the same generation, but we all know every house is different. Everyone has a different set of rules. Every school, every child is different. And even if you grew up in the same school, you may have a different experience. Some are smarter, some are less, right? Some do better on tests, some do worse, right? We all, every person is different. In our traits, it's, no di it's, it's the same. In our traits, one person might be uh, more, uh, more uh, inclined to truth and one person less inclined to truth. One person be more inclined to kindness, and one person less inclined to kindness. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just gives you a different set of tools. Every person is given a set of tools that they need to accomplish their mission in life. Every person is given their tools. Every person. It's, it's an amazing thing. There's nobody who has a free ride. Nobody. One person, it's the parents. One person, it's the spouse. One person, it's the children. One person, it's the friends. One person, it's the community. Everybody has their baggage. 
There's no one who gets a free ride. And everyone has traits that they're given as a gift from God to deal with all of the challenges and all of the opportunities that are going to come throughout their lifetime. Our number one goal is to discover who we are. It's a, it's a, it's not a, it's, don't think of it as something which is too daunting. It's too, uh, it's too insurmountable. I'll never figure out who this crazy person is within me. Don't worry about it. We're going to take it one trade at a time, one Sunday at a time. We'll figure it out to understand one second. You know what? I see that there's some room for perfection in this trait. I have something I need to do a little bit better. Great. Let's take that step of growth. There's some some traits you might say, you know what? In this trait, I think I'm perfect. And that's not, again, it's not arrogant. My grandfather says that every person has a trait which is perfect. One single trait. You have to identify what that trait is. And if you saw that that pyramid and the upside down pyramid that I showed you before of my traits, right? On the top is that perfect trait and the bottom is that perfect negative trait. Okay, the one that you have to work on the most. Right, uh, but the first is making sure that our positive traits are getting ratcheted up and strengthened, because that's what we're going to need to fix our negative traits. You're not going to be able to just um, hit yourself over your head and say, "I'm such a terrible person," because look, I'm uh, I, I have such hatred in my heart, and uh, um, or I'm so lazy, or or um, I'm so lustful. Right, I, I'm just a terrible. That's not going to help anyone. You have to use the positive traits to build you. And then from there, you can overcome and, and learn to battle the negative traits. Okay, so our goal is to perfect our traits. We're all unique. We're all different. We're all special. Overcoming our individual challenges. And you need to be cautious, even though we mentioned earlier that you should have a friend, someone who you trust, who can share with you some of your qualities and some of your flaws, but... King Solomon warns us in Proverbs to be very careful with, with criticism. He says, make sure that it's right for you because that person may not know you, may not understand you so well, and therefore they might just be giving you criticism because they have a, they have a chip on their shoulder about something. You happen to be the victim that they're going to pick on. right? So just because someone says something doesn't, need to get, doesn't mean you need to get worked up about it. It doesn't mean that you need to uh, get all insulted, right? I, for myself, when someone tells me something uh, about myself that's negative, I, I thank them. And I say, thank you for bringing it to my attention. Now it's, some, it's another thing I can work on, right? Or I can just say, I hate you, <laughs> right? But that's not going to help me, and that's not going to make me a better person. And with the pursuit to want to become a better person, it says those who criticize you, love them. Thank them for it because they're guiding you and assisting you to become a better person. Imagine you have that blind spot, but because you drive this fancy schmancy car, in your mirror, it'll light up when there's something in your blind spot. It's letting you know that there's something there. That's the way we should look at uh, any type of constructive criticism, even if it's not given in a constructive way, to take it as a as a meaningful opportunity for us to apply change to our lives. Okay? Um, just one more quick thing. Our mind knows two things. Right, wrong, good, bad, true, false, black, white. Okay, that's, that's why our brain is divided into two different compartments. Obviously, our brain is a lot more sophisticated than that. But it, just to narrow it down, our brain works in a very simple manner yes no good bad our heart is emotion and our heart works on a whole different wavelength i know it's bad for me the doctor said i shouldn't eat it but it looks so good that's the heart okay that's the emotion right but i really want to right that's your emotion Right? If someone were to say, is this a good thing for you to eat? They'll say, no, it's terrible. Should you smoke, yes or no? No, it's awful. Everybody knows it. You have, only have to look at the box. It says, smoking kills. Right? You know, right? It, or they're almost saying, I'm going to kill you. Right? On the box of cigarettes. And p- still people smoke. Why do they smoke? Because there is an emotion that's pulling them towards it. Okay, we could talk about addiction and things like that, but the, the, the urge that someone has that's not being controlled. Just if we're talking about that, I wanted to share with you one of my favorite stories to understand Musser 
and a person of Musar. It's told about one of the great Musar masters that one night he woke up and he needed a cigarette. And back then it was before we had any studies to show that it was damaging to your health. He really, really wanted a cigarette. The only place he can get was the other side of his town. It was a long, long walk. He had to walk to the other side of the town and he'd be able to buy a cigarette. So he started thinking. He put his Musar cap on. He says, you know what? If I walk across town just for a cigarette, I'm lustful. Well, I, I can't control my urges. I can't control my desires. You walked all the way across town two o'clock in the morning just so you can get a cigarette? Boy, that's someone who can control his urges, right? Right? That would be terrible. But he said, one second, but if I don't go, then I'm just being lazy, perhaps. <laughs> right? So what does he do? He's in this dilemma. Do I go or do I not go? So the story has it that he went, didn't buy the cigarette, and walked back. Right? So he overcame the laziness and didn't fall into the trap of lust. That's, that's an idea. That's, that's um, the, how the Musser system works of having our intellect control our emotions. It's a very, very important thing. We have emotions. We have desires. We have urges. We have things that we, that we want. You know, it's a very interesting thing. I heard from the CEO of Neiman Marcus. The CEO said, we don't sell anything that people need. Only things that people want. It's a brilliant, brilliant observation. That means we don't sell anything that your intellect tells you, I need this. Only things your emotion tells you, I want this. All right? That's the difference. Our heart is the source of our desires and our urges. And one of the great Musar masters uh, of the previous generation, he's, he defined Musar as making your heart feel what your intellect understands. Making your heart feel what your intellect understands. Meaning, if your intellect understands that anger is a bad thing, how do I get my heart to feel that? Because the heart is the bed of our actions as well. Many times, if we don't work on our heart, possibly we're just going to be follow, following our emotions. It's very interesting that humans are vertical. Animals are horizontal. We know that the higher something is, the more important they are, right? If you look at a hierarchy of a company, they put the CEO on top, and then they put the rest of the employees b below. The CEO has the most prominent position. The human being has the head, the mind, at the highest point, and the rest of the organs beneath it. Animals have them all at the same level. A, an animal doesn't need to use their intellect, their their instincts are inborn. I had a, 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 a rabbi of my community when I was a child uh, came over to me after, after prayers one uh, Sunday morning, and he tells me, tell me, do you want a cute little kitten? He says, my cat had like eight kittens. So I said, maybe. I came to his house, and I see on his back porch these cute little teeny kittens. They're half a day old. They're cute little kittens. I said, I picked the one I thought was the prettiest and the cutest, and... I took it, I brought it home. My mother almost killed me, right? And um, it was, it's, it's an amazing thing that uh, that little kitten knew how to walk. And if I would put it on the rooftop, which I didn't, but if I would have, it would have walked to the edge of the rooftop, looked down, sees there's a drop, turns around, walks away. But if you take a baby a half a day old, it can't talk, it can't walk, it can't, it can't do anything except for eat from its mother, right? R essentially, it's, it, it can do. It doesn't have any instincts. We have to learn those instincts. We have to train those instincts. Animals have everything built in. That's why an Adam is Adama. Adama is like the earth. You have to plow it. You have to sow. You have to water it. You have to harvest it. And then it, it grows. But an animal is called a behema. A behema is ba. Ma, in it is everything. All of its instincts are there. Next week, we'll continue to talk about a few of the characteristics that animals have inborn that we can learn from them. Because the Talmud says, if we didn't have the Torah to, te to teach us good traits, we can learn good traits from animals. So we'll do a few of them next week and hopefully continue the study. To all of our friends online, thank you so much for listening. We hope you subscribe to this channel. And uh, if you have any questions about any of these uh, classes or if you want these forms, these uh, Musser study forms, uh, 
you're welcome to email me at a w o l b e a wolby at torchweb.org t o r c h w e b.org thank you and shalom from houston